Today's video is going to be very interesting. I'm curious how long it will take for my truck to become green. Not exactly that kind of green, more environmentally green. Are electric trucks actually better for the environment than gasoline-powered trucks? I mean, yeah, as I drive up the mountain right now, I'm not producing any emissions. There's no tailpipe or exhaust, but my battery had to be mined somewhere and manufactured, and I had to plug into the grid to charge up, and the grid might not be that clean. Those fossil fuels are being burned somewhere, and finally, what happens at the end of my truck's life with the battery pack and recycling? Can lithium batteries even be recycled? I am pretty hungry right now though, so this video is sponsored by Huel. More on them later. I'm gonna meet you farther up the mountain. Let's get started. I'm gonna be comparing my electric Rivian to the most popular truck in the world, the Ford F-150, the gas-powered version, so we can see which truck is actually more green. All this information is pretty easy to find online. Rivian themselves has not released an environmental impact report yet. They're waiting till after their first year of production, which is reasonable. But there is enough information on vehicle manufacturing and battery production that we can extrapolate and get a decent prediction of how many carbon emissions this is producing. How do you like that thing? Dude, that is sick. Joe, you're Jerry Rig everything. Yeah, cool, man. And of course, all of my sources will be linked down in the video description. Let's start with manufacturing, as in resource extraction, production, assembly, and delivery of the vehicles before they even drive their first mile. There are a lot of different estimates on the CO2 emissions during production, anywhere from 2 all the way to 17 tons, but a recent study done just last year from the Argonne National Laboratory seemed to be most in-depth saying that a regular pickup truck takes about 6.5 tons of CO2 to produce, factoring in all of the mining for the metals, along with the body panels and drivetrain, everything that goes into production, 6.5 tons. But you'll notice once you add a battery to the vehicle, the CO2 emissions over double. For a truck with a 120 kilowatt hour battery pack, we're looking at 16 tons of CO2 released during the mining and production of that vehicle. You could build two regular trucks for the CO2 emissions of one electric truck. Big yikes. Today's numbers say that gas-powered trucks are way more environmentally friendly to produce than electric trucks. That's the end of the story, I guess. Gas wins. Thanks, Dump, for watching. Unless, of course, we start to factor in the emissions that occur while driving. To calculate that is pretty easy, pretty well regulated across the nation. We're going to be using the two-wheel drive Ford F-150 with a miles per gallon of about 25, which is really good, almost better than some cars. We're going to give the gas-powered truck the most benefit of the doubt that we could possibly give it. If you remember, gas-powered cars are about 30% efficient, meaning that if you do put $10 of gas into your gas tank, $7 get evaporated and burned away as heat, while only $3 of gas goes towards pushing your vehicle forward. Gas engines aren't very efficient. If we look at the 25 miles per gallon of the Ford F-150, we can see that it has an average emissions of 6.7 tons of CO2 every single year. If we estimate that they are driving about 15,000 miles a year, which is the national average here in the United States. We won't factor in the emissions of all the semi-trucks bringing gasoline to the millions of gas stations. We're just focusing on the vehicles themselves. Now for the Rivian, and this is where things get interesting. Since there aren't any tailpipe emissions coming out of the truck while it's driving, but while it's charging is a different story emissions have to be emitted somewhere. I live in Utah, and our grid is slightly more clean than the national average, but it's not entirely renewable just yet. I do have solar panels on my house, so the energy going into my truck is 100% clean, but we aren't going to factor that in just yet. We'll pretend as if I'm pulling from the grid, because not everyone has solar panels. To get the breakdown of Utah's electrical grid, we move over to the EPA's website, which can tell us exactly what percentage of our energy comes from different sources. Here in Utah, we have 18% natural gas, 18% coal, 45% hydro, and 10% wind. 
with just 1% being solar. So using that breakdown and fueleconomy.gov, we can see that my Rivian emits 142 grams of CO2 by charging every single mile. And if we use the same 15,000 miles driven per year as we did with the uh, gas-powered Ford F-150, we can see that my Rivian emits 2.3 metric tons of CO2 just by charging from a non-clean grid. Electric vehicles aren't quite as clean as we might be led to believe. There's still a lot of carbon coming from the grid, but still only half as much if I were driving a gas-powered truck. Having a large power plant burning fossil fuels is more efficient than having a small power plant under the hood of a truck. For example, it takes about as much energy to heat up your oven and bake 12 cupcakes as it does for an industrial bakery to bake 200 cupcakes. Bigger plants are more efficient and I'm just kind of hungry. But due to the more efficient location of where I'm burning my fossil fuels, at some point there will be a crossover where the electric truck becomes greener than the gas-powered truck even with the massive amount of carbon emitted during its production. And if my math is correct, that would be right around the two-year mark, when both vehicles are hitting right around that 30,000 miles, if I'm charging from Utah's mix of grid energy. Obviously, I have solar panels on my house, so the energy going into this truck is green, and it'll break even with its carbon emissions much sooner, around 25,000 miles. Remember, these numbers are just estimates. Neither Ford nor Rivian have said exactly how much carbon is being produced when they manufacture stuff, and the efficiency of manufacturing is improving at a rate that will make this video obsolete in five years, especially with all the new battery production facilities like the Gigafactory opening up in Texas. As things get more efficient, the CO2 emitted per battery goes down. As I mentioned earlier, Utah is one of the cleaner grids in the United States. If we were to use the average cleanliness of power generated, my Rivian would be emitting 3.3 tons of CO2 every year just by charging, and would take about four years to break even when compared to a gas-powered truck. But a four-year-old truck is still basically brand new, with plenty of life ahead of it. If we look at the CO2 emitted over the entire lifetime of our two trucks, assuming lifetime is about 200,000 miles, even charging from a non-clean grid and accounting for manufacturing, the electric truck will produce half as many emissions as the gas-powered truck. So are electric trucks perfectly clean? No, they are not, but they are still more clean than the alternative as long as they are driven for about three or four years. So they can pay off their carbon debt of being manufactured in the first place. So we've discussed manufacturing, we've discussed driving, but what about end of life? What about recycling emissions? A very interesting subject, but first, I need a little nourishment. Huge thanks to Huel for sponsoring this video. My truck might not have as many outlets as the Lightning, but we still have enough juice to boil water. Huel provides 100% nutritionally complete meals with 27 plant-based vitamins and minerals with a whopping 24 grams of protein. All of that just by adding hot water and it's ready in minutes. One meal I haven't tried yet is the mac and cheese and I definitely want to get my hands on that one. Today for lunch we are having a bit of the chicken mushroom and Cajun pasta. These are made with natural ingredients with real herbs and spices. The Cajun pasta has a bit of a zing to it, so you have to be ready for that, but it is very good and very filling. Along with the plant-based chicken and mushroom, 10 out of 10. The hot and savory meals are my favorite, but you don't have to take my word for it. Huel has sold over 200 million meals in over 100 different countries. You can try it out for yourself. I have a link in the description. Meals start at less than four bucks with free shipping. And thanks to Huel for sponsoring this video. Where were we? End of life. Now, obviously trucks are mostly metal and metal can be infinitely recycled. You just crunch it up, melt it down, reuse it in a new truck. The bodies of both vehicles are gonna be the same. Also, fun little side fact, the lead acid batteries that run the 12 volt system in basically every car on the road are one of the most recycled commodities in the United States. At 99%, they have a near perfect recycling rate. And of course, the stats for how long a vehicle normally lasts are kind of all over the place. It really depends on how long you drive. But a good rule of thumb is around 200,000 miles 
if you take extraordinarily good care of your vehicle. That 200,000 mark is usually the point you can get to before needing an engine swap or a transmission replacement. You know, the really large repairs. So we'll use those same numbers for both vehicles and Tesla says, since they've been around the longest, they have the most data, that even after 200,000 miles worth of driving, their battery health or battery capacity is still at 90%, which means that the batteries have the potential to outlast the vehicle itself. We'll still leave it at 200,000 though, since that's about when vehicles start to get tired. Tesla has also said that with their millions of electric cars on the road, they have never thrown a battery in a landfill. When the car reaches its end of life or needs a battery replacement, Tesla has the ability to recycle it and retrieve 92% of the materials inside those battery cells, which is a pretty big deal. Last year alone, they retrieved 1,500 tons worth of nickel, 300 tons worth of copper, and 200 tons worth of cobalt that they can then reuse and put into new batteries. And I don't know the exact carbon footprint of that manufacturing process, but since they are grabbing materials that don't have to be mined, I assume it's similar to the aluminum. Apple says they use recycled aluminum because it has 1 40th the carbon footprint of getting new aluminum from the ground. And if the carbon footprint of using recycled materials is lower than the initial carbon footprint of our vehicle, remember how big it was at the beginning, is also lower since mining new materials is where most of that initial footprint comes from. Part of the issue with talking about recycling though is that since lithium batteries last for so long, we haven't needed large scale recycling. After the end of life of a battery inside of a vehicle, it can go on to be grid storage or work at a supercharging station. There's even a stadium in Amsterdam run off of 150 Nissan Leaf batteries as its backup power. And people are buying the battery packs out of wrecked Teslas to use in their own home storage or in their own electric vehicle conversions like I did with my Hummer project. When it does come time to recycle the batteries though, and that time will eventually come, we can do all that right here in the United States. This year, a factory is opening up in Georgia that can recycle 30,000 tons worth of batteries, and Redwood Materials in Nevada is currently recycling enough materials every year to build 60,000 new EVs. And another facility is opening in Arizona, and another one in New York. There's a lot of money reclaiming the materials inside of battery packs, and there's a lot of people jumping on that train. Either way, with such a long lifespan and 92% of the materials able to be recovered at the moment, and with how valuable these are, no one in their right mind is throwing these batteries into a landfill. Either way, it's been super fun to research this and see the process. You know, electric vehicles might not be as green as we initially thought, but there does come a point where they are greener than their gas-powered counterparts. Now, if we really want a solution to emissions, the answer isn't vehicles, though. It's kind of dumb to have a 7,000 pound machine transporting a 200 pound person. The real solution would be bullet trains. And it would be nice if we had a whole lot of them, but that's a story for a different day. Feel free to share this video. I've seen a lot of interesting theories flying around lately, and it's nice to have some solid data we can learn from. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Come hang out with me on Instagram and Twitter, and let me know what your thoughts are on electric vehicles and everything we talked about today down in the comments. Thanks, Tom, for watching, and I'll see you around.